So it's been just over a month since I posted the video on the clock and it's been running pretty well but I wanted to give you a bit of an update because I have, have had to tackle um, one particular issue which I wanted to talk about. Um, I've also connected it to a microset timing system and um, I don't know if you can see I've got a, an optical sensor that the pendulum is passing through and that's connected to the microset system itself and there's a barometric sensor and that's all connected to APCs. But before talking about the um, timekeeping ability of the clock and the stability of it, I wanted to just tell you about this problem that I've been trying to sort out. And, and the problem has to do with the, the remontoir not triggering. Uh, the clock rang, ran perfectly for about three weeks and then it started to have these non-triggers of the remontoir which will eventually lead to the clock stopping. So I figured that that was to do with the non-uniform transmission of power from the cantilevered weight through the gear train up to the remontoir. In clock making, there's an, there's an important term called wheel depthing, which allows the clock maker to position the clock wheels at their ideal meshing distances. This is usually achieved with a depthing tool, and this is one that I made some time ago. And um, you, basically you, you mount the wheels on this tool and then you can adjust their relative positions by turning this, this knob, which moves the, the wheels in and out relative, relative to each other. And then you can, when you've got the correct distance that they're running as smoothly as possible, you can measure the distance between these two points and transcribe that to the clock plates. Now this process wasn't possible on my clock because the plates were made of fused quartz and I had all the bearing points CNC machined and I used their theoretically correct positions to give this wheel depth thing, which was almost certainly incorrect for my handmade wheels. Combined with my use of lantern pinions with fixed pins uh, probably means that there is considerable sliding friction in my wheel train. Also, when I magnified the teeth on my great wheel, it looked like there were already tiny wear marks where the one and a half mil pins engage the teeth. Um, and the point loading on these teeth is probably quite high with such small diameter pins. So I've taken the plunge and made a, a new great wheel, um, which will work with much larger diameter roller pinions. With the old 180 tooth wheel, the gap between teeth was just under 1.6 mil and to get a roller and an arbor in this space was going to be really quite a tall order. So what I'm going to do is redesign the wheel with a fatter tooth, but with a much greater distance between the teeth. And actually, if you look at the, um, the clocks that Harrison built, his teeth were very much of this form. The, the gap between the teeth was much larger than the thickness of the teeth in order to get roller pinions in. And indeed on clock B, Martin Burgess used this theme as well with, with thinner teeth and larger gaps. Martin seemed to use a cycloidal tooth profile, um, but Harrison seems to just use a circular profile. So um, in this tooth here, which I've designed, I'm using a, an approximate cycloidal profile. And I've designed a pinion to go with it here. And I will just show you how they move together. Hopefully this will work. Yes, here we go. So here is my new roll pinion. I've just used three mil diameter brass for the um, for the trundles and one mil pivot steel for the arbors. And the whole assembly is they're fitted dry. They're no, no Loctite, so that the arbors and the trundles are free to turn. And the whole assembly is just secured with this with this end plate and uh, now I'll show you it mounted on the clock. So here we are back at the clock and you can see the new great wheel with the larger gap between the teeth and then I'll try and zoom in on the pinion, the roller pinion which you can just see there and it's been running for about a month now with the new roller pinion and great wheel and I have to say the, the remontoir is so much smoother 
it's quite slow, but it's consistently slow, whereas before it would sometimes be painfully slow and and then sometimes really quite violently fast. So the roll opinion has really made a huge difference on this clock. I know there's a lot of debate about the usefulness of roll opinions, in particular because they take quite a long time to make, um, but it has been very effective for me, and I guess I'm more than happy to go with the theories of John Harrison. I now want to return to the subject of the accuracy of this clock, and I'd be really interested to hear from viewers about what they think I should be able to achieve from a compound pendulum. Um, so we'll look at some of the data traces and, um, and, and see what actually is going on. This is the first trace that represents six days from mid-December and um, I've got the microset set up to take a reading once every 120 seconds which represents a full turn of the escape wheel and on the y-axis I've got the clock rate um, in terms of seconds per day and the green line represents the air temperature and the red is the barometric pressure and the blue is the pendulum amplitude. And the first thing I noticed as I was seeing the traces coming in was the strong correlation between um, air temperature and clock rate. And essentially, every time the air temperature reduces, the clock rate reduces. And likewise, as the air temperature rises, the, um, the, the clock rate also rises. So, um, and this is represented the whole way through the trace. The other possible connection is the barometric pressure, and I, th I think with a fall in barometric pressure we're seeing a, 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 a fall in the rate of the clock, and likewise with a rise we're seeing this gradual increase, falling barometric pressure, decrease, rising barometric pressure, increase. I'm not sure that this is a definite correlation. This is the current microset 10-day uh, trace, and. Um, the, this lower line is the absolute time um, and each bar is five seconds. So you can see that over the last 10 days, we've lost just over 20 seconds. And although I thought I had it rated for the first day, it's gradually started to lose more and more. And at this point, it was losing about two seconds a day. And it's held fairly steady at that loss for two seconds now. So I think... Um, I'm going to try and adjust the clock. I've got, I don't know if you can see, I've got uh, three lead weights on top of the pendulum hub and I'm just going to try and brush them off with this uh, watercolour brush so I don't disturb the um, pendulum and see if I can bring it back to to rate. The final plot shows the, um, the effect of taking those three weights off the pendulum hub. And of course I'm taking them off the point um, above the suspension so with a compound pendulum if you add more weight to the point above the suspension you slow the clock down so taking these three weights off of course will speed the clock up and indeed they have so the clock has gone from losing about two and a half seconds a day to gaining about one second a day so it has been really interesting playing around with the microset system um, but I would point out that my clock was never designed with accuracy in mind it was more to demonstrate um, the Harrison Remontoir and the Grasshopper Escapement. But I'm really pleased with the, um, the potential accuracy of it. It looks like it should achieve plus or minus two seconds a day over the medium term, which is really a lot better than I was expecting. Um, I'd be really interested to hear any of your views on, on whether this is good, bad or expected. And I look forward to catching up with you in my next video and just to avoid any confusion you are currently looking at the famous Burgess clock B which of course was accurate to within five eighths of a second in a hundred days a truly amazing feat and something that maybe we can all aspire to